You know, I don't believe that Peggy McIntosh, the author of this morning's reading on white privilege, really intended to paralyze us with layers of guilt. <laughs> I think she did want us to see what has almost always been invisible, namely those privileges in our life that carry us through all the days and years of our existence. Our home, our work, our education, our dreams are all aspects of how we live detached, actually, from the reality of racism, totally oblivious to the fact that the fruits we enjoy are mostly received by way of the privileges that we carry as members of this society. What's so interesting, at least what I found so fascinating, was how Macintosh came to this realization. She did so through her, her scholarly work at Wellesley College in women's studies, by which she learned that men outright fail to acknowledge their privilege over women. They were, in fact, even blind to the idea that they gained advantages from women's disadvantages the power imbalance had become such a normal part of society that men were not even aware of their dominance. Once normalized, the success of men at the expense of women becomes virtually invisible. You just don't really see it happen. But Macintosh's eyes were wide open. As a feminist working on issues with women of color, she experienced their anger, their frustration, aimed at her. The same invisible and unconscious oppression that men were oblivious to was now manifest in her. Macintosh is startled, shocked even, as she is unwittingly placed in this column marked oppressor the last place she'd ever thought she'd end up. What Macintosh had always perceived as normal actually represented a suppression of freedom by women of color. Macintosh learned that white normal did not necessarily equal black normal, which when you think about it is quite an assumption for, for white people to make. What Macintosh freely admitted was that she was actually allowing or trying to allow them to be like us. Not good. Women of color never accepted feminist ideology, regarding it strictly as an upper class white woman's battle to be liberated from male subjugation. It wasn't their battle. So women of color constructed their own womanist philosophies, attitudes and actions more relevant to their own experiences, which was understandably far different from that of upper class white women. And so Macintosh really admits to exacerbating the alienation felt by women of color. And once she understands what's going on and she understands the parallel between you know, men over women and whites over black, she begins to unpack what she calls, and I like this image so much, she unpacks her knapsack that contains all the invisible forms of her own white privilege. And her conclusion is that society's ideas about what constitutes normal reinforces systems that confer dominance, advantage, and privileges to some and not to others. She also wrestles with her new understanding, and this is difficult, that to improve the status of another, if we're going to work to improve the status of someone else, it then becomes imperative that one somehow lessen the status for oneself. Difficult to pursue. What am I 
going to give up. And this is what she says repeatedly. It's what she wanted to ask the men. You know, you know you, the, the rhetoric is fine, but at you know, the end of the day, what is it you're going to give up? What is it you're going to make less? How are you going to deal with this dominance? And they were kind of reticent to respond to that. And yet, when we see that part of the challenge is for others to be raised into a more equal status in society, then something has to give. We have to give less of ourselves. And so we kind of subconsciously, perhaps, push against that. But I don't think we really want to see ourselves that way. And yet we come to understand that power and prosperity are, in fact, limited to those at the top of the food chain. The very notion of equalizing power and prosperity carries implications that some of what the privileged have accumulated will, by necessity, be compromised or even lost if shared with others. What McIntosh makes so clear in her essay is the brutal fact that advantages gained for some come at the expense of advantages lost for others. This translates, for example, into keeping tax liabilities low for the super rich at the expense of social programs for the poor. So society as a hierarchy, a ladder to climb up or down. This hierarchy implies that as long as others are down, then those of privilege and power are up. Now, does not, does not this system raise serious moral issues? Self-interest may or may not lie at the core of all humanity, but the gap in inequities between those who prosper and those who are barely hanging on overwhelms the innate sense of right and wrong, just and unjust, fair and unfair. But in America today, where the distance between rich and poor are the distance is at an historical high. Those who prosper aim to make those who have virtually nothing responsible for their own situation, responsible for their own condition or where they find themselves. Even our vaunted Unitarian forebear, Ralph Waldo Emerson, wrote in his essay called American Civilization, and I quote, we live in a new and exceptional age America is another word for opportunity. Our whole history appears like at last efforts are made by the divine providence on behalf of the human race. America is another word for opportunity. So that's what he said about 150 years ago, but that is precisely the image seized upon today by those who find themselves at the top as though privilege, their own privilege, had nothing to do with the opportunities that presented themselves historically. Now, once again, privilege becomes invisible to the 1%, the 2%, the 5%, or frankly, anybody who is comfortable. You know, the idea, the idea is that you, you either grab hold of America's opportunity or you squander it. That's, that's how our system works, always has. It is what now compromises the norm in American society. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sought for us to take another look at American normative behavior. He gave voice to the inequities that keep weighing upon black citizens, keeping them down or near the bottom of the ladder of prosperity. He put his life on the line to reveal to all who were willing to open their eyes that opportunity was not equal across the board. Overt discrimination against black citizens was so entrenched in the American way that black oppression had virtually become invisible. It was so accepted. It had become the norm that society proceeded 
as though unconscious of its violation of civil and human rights. History, I think, tells the story. Ever since 1775, when the royal governor of Virginia offered freedom to slaves who would turn against their revolutionary masters, American statesmen held that freeing an enemy's slaves ran contrary to civilized warfare. George Washington and the Continental Congress complained bitterly when British forces carried away slaves when they left New York in 1783. In the War of 1812, British raids along the Chesapeake Bay encouraged thousands of slaves to escape to freedom. For more than a decade following that war, our government pursued compensation from the British, contending that the laws of war protected slave owners from enemy depredations. And so we need to fully understand that the norm instituted at the very founding of our country insisted on laws that protected slave owners rather than slaves. The rationale was that to seize an enemy's slaves was to make war on civilian economic resources. John Witt, a, a professor at Yale Law School, helps us understand the volatility of something like Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation delivered in 1862, to which Jefferson Davis responded with just blind fury. He condemned the proclamation as two words he used, barbaric and inhumane, swearing never to recognize black Union soldiers as entitled to the treatment afforded prisoners at war. He promised to execute them all. So be it. <laughs> 